Welcome to the ABQ Accent, where catalysts, innovators, and risk takers share what their accent is on their work. Like a spoken accent, we all have an inflection or emphasis on where we put our energy. Join us to learn how these folks are putting their accents to work, building their vision of the future, and how you can get involved. Hello, everyone. I'm Mariah Harrison, and this is the ABQ Accent. And today we have a very special guest, Christina Rogers, an old friend. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Mariah. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, My pleasure to be able to sit and hold still with you for a little bit, and I want to learn more about what you're doing. So right now you're the executive director of the Borellis Community Coalition and Main Street Program. Mm -hmm. Um, You have uh, experience being a creative placemaking consultant. Yep. And you were also formerly the treasurer for the Bud Ellis Community or Neighborhood Association for six years. Mm -hmm. So the work that you do, I would say, is... um, Acute. You work in a very particular area of town around particular projects, and I'm really interested in your background and what brought you to this. Um, so I grew up all over the world. <laughs> uh, my mom's from Spain, and my father uh, worked in the space program as a civilian. Though, so uh, we moved all over, okay. like an army brat, but like, but in the space program. Um, he worked at White Sands. So okay. the longest I actually ever lived anywhere growing up was. Las Cruz is New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So if I have a home state, it's New Mexico. Um, And then I ended up here, kind of moved here for a relationship like so many people, Mm -hmm. um, fell back in love with New Mexico, like a lot of people, (laughs) Um, come back. Uh, And then, um, because I grew up in Las Cruces, I knew northern New Mexico was a lot different. Mm -hmm. So, and I had been really interested in sustainability. Um, and so I was interested in historic preservation. So I took the, so I um, completed the program at UNM School of Architecture. Yeah. Learned a lot. It was under director Chris Wilson. It was really great. The current director is actually on our board. Oh, nice. Um, so there's a lot of continuity there. Um, and there was just a couple of things that I found really frustrating. Sure. Uh, one of those was the development process mm-hmm. where it seemed like no one was winning. <laughs> Like the physical development of neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah like how out. to develop them, the community engagement. Mm-hmm. It didn't seem like the developers were even particularly winning. No one was happy. Yeah. And it just seemed like if we were all working together, it would be better for everyone. So that was actually the thing that piqued most of my interest. Mm-hmm. Um, then I took a little detour and went out to California <laughs> <laughs> to do some family stuff. And then I started creative placemaking. Okay. And that's leveraging arts and culture to bring more people to the table and kind of break down silos in government. Because government, I mean, the government's, it's a big machine. Right. And so, you know, traffic, transit planning does not necessarily talk to economic development. So that, that's kind of what creative place making is about and bringing more people to the table in a way that they can understand. And then hopefully you've got some cool art projects going too. Yeah, that, that are visible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I actually did some consulting with the city, and then I coordinated a creative placemaking leadership mm-hmm. summit. I remember that. Thanks. I attended. Uh, mm-hmm. With so, a widespread partnership from the city, yeah. and that was really amazing. <clears throat> um, I did a big. Uh, I was on a creative on a design team in Gallup to redevelop a couple blocks of their downtown mm-hmm. as a creative placemaking consultant. Um, but I lived in Bardellas, and they just stole my heart. <laughs> yeah. um, and so. When this position um, at the Bartolos Community Coalition opened up, they asked me to join them, actually to do an incubation project right. at Fourth and Cole. Right, yeah. And then they also needed a Main Street director. So I ended up just Rolling absorbing in. a couple of roles. And now we have a few large projects. You do, yeah. And you've been, I feel like you've been a, a rock for that whole trajectory, like you, a cornerstone of that activity in a really... That's good. Kudos. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm all right. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, yeah. at the paperwork. I'm really good at the paperwork. And that's sometimes the most important part, especially for those of us that, that drown in it. So thank you. Um, and I, I think the Creative Placemaking Summit, I'm glad you brought that to, to you, that you mentioned that because I remember those couple of days. There were, there were critical relationships that I built from that when I was at the university. And, you know, it's not the typical type of um, conference that maybe a staff member from the university would go to, but because of my interest mm-hmm. in community development and, and neighborhood um, 
you know, experiences. That was, that made sense for me. So as I said, I made some relationships. I remember visiting a couple spots because we had, we were visiting sites around town, not just sitting in conference rooms. Mm -hmm. so, um, that was really great. Thank you for that work. Sure. But that's, that's kind of a, um, like a testament to what creative place making is, right? Like you wouldn't go to a planning conference, mm -hmm. but that's like gives a whole entree to a bunch of people to get more involved. Right. And yeah. remember things and it make was, it less scary. Yeah. It, was, it was widely attended, or at least, you know, a broad representation. <clears throat> and so that sort of harkens back to how I met you was when I was at the university. I don't remember the actual project. I think it was more of a work, a learning workshop where you attended to sort of just show up. And so did I to learn more about what was happening. Um, and it was held at the rainforest right after it had been built. And I think maybe mm. we were talking about a pitch program or something, something around economic development, maybe for the Anderson School. Anyway, I digress. I remember that we just really got along and I really loved mm -hmm. your energy and I was interested in learning more about you and sort of here and there we've stuck together and reconnected and I like. And I'm so thankful. Mm -hmm. So there was more things about the work that you took from the historical preservation program at the University of New Mexico School of Architecture. Go Lobos, me too, double Lobo. Um, what is it that you feel like, is there a perspective or a philosophy about historical preservation that sits with you that you sort of bring to your work regularly? Yeah, really fundamentally, um, it was very steeped um, in indigenous planning. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I'm Basque. That's not a thing you know. That's why I'm actually Basque, and we're one of the oldest indigenous groups in Europe. Um, Spell that? B-A-S-Q-U-E. -E. Um, it's northern spain mm -hmm. um uh and so that's not a thing that i'd actually thought about that much until i i came here so there's a whole history there mm -hmm. that's very similar to uh tactics used in the states absolutely um to disconnect people mm -hmm. um and we did her chris wilson did a really great job of just starting with cosmology and where people say they came from and beliefs and um how you treat the earth yeah and um you you know not unique to new mexico but unique to so many places people build amazing um buildings out of mud <laughs> right all over the yeah. all the over basics. the world yeah and so that was something that just really stuck with me was just um the sense of place and what connection means that's mm. Um, I think we still hold that so dear, and it's just in our DNA in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that just always stayed with me. And so I sort of go in order of settlement when, mm -hmm. I, when I listen to people. That's a really good point. That is an entirely different perspective. Like, we, we, we so generalize about the city we might be currently living in and not think about somebody else's, not only historical, familial, but the indigenous pieces of the land that you're standing on. And... I, I really love the way that you put that uh, thinking when you talk to people. Thanks. Um, you know, it comes up all the time. Yeah. Like we're talking about Route 66 now. So mm -hmm. the, we've got the anniversary coming up in 2026. Um, yeah. I'm excited that we are incorporating all these layers because not many people know that, um, that the Camino Real actually sits on the indigenous footpath. So it's not like people reinvented the wheel. Mm -hmm. They had Just guides. They had pavement. Yeah, there yeah. were well-worn trade routes. We followed those, and then um, the original Route 66 actually goes down 4th Street. Mm -hmm. It's the only place in the country where um, Route 66 crosses itself. Interesting. How does it cross? Where, where is that? 4th and Central. So it used to go south. Is it a roundabout? What does that look like? No, it's just the intersection. But how does it, how does it so it used to go south? So it used oh, to go south. One. It was like a whole different route yeah. that, um, that just went down south and then went down south into the South Valley. That makes sense. Yeah. No, and we don't think about it. Um, I mean, I've seen the overlay map of both the old version and the current yeah, version. Yeah, so the old version is called pre-1937 alignment. Not really aligned. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we like it, though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the, Route 66 is a good example because what's which anniversary are we coming up on? A hundred, right? I, I think the centennial yes. official of, yeah. So, and... Because Bud Ellis has a, a unique place in that history, do you, um, are you working with any other parts of the nation that are doing a celebratory, um, I don't know, peace event? 
Yeah. So, I mean, the official route is going to be along Central, especially because we have the longest. I'm so factoid based. We have the it's longest gonna... stretch <laughs> in an urban area in the country. So it's mainly focused on that. But all. Six miles? 11. 11. I think oh, it's 11. 11. I remember. Yeah. Okay. I have to check. Um, but all the Main Street programs in the state are working together. We're mm. coordinating. And then there's a Route 66 Association that several of the um, people are involved in too. And then the city's got a lot going on. Right. Um, so like downtown Main Street and Knopf Hill Main Street are super involved in that planning work. So we've got stuff going on. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. Mm -hmm. um, a, a former guest on our podcast, actually, her father drove from Chicago with a friend of his down the old, the, enti the entire old Route 66 through New Mexico oh, to California just in the last three weeks. I think they just finished last week. Oh, wow. In an old, let's see, I'm going to get this wrong. <gasps> 1950 Ford something or another. It was like 14 feet long, ginormous vehicle. Anyway, and of course they got a lot of looks and, and they're, oh, it was a Cadillac, not a Ford. Yeah, they That's restored. Yeah. They restored a car and they've been driving along. Mm -hmm. And he's, one of them's 90. Her dad is 90 and his buddy's, I don't know, 80 or something. And they just were like, we need to make this trip. And so as part of that, they involved visit abq and hopefully those videos will be posted during the celebration that's awesome that's kind of neat we had a big party for him in knob hill i've tried kind of following along on facebook yeah neat. Mm -hmm. and so there's more to look forward to from this route 66 celebration in your neighborhood and others so let's talk a little bit more um branching out into your some of your other work i know that um when you were briefing me on some things i also didn't know besides you being basque um you came to albuquerque and in hit the ground running with your own small business in Knob Hill, mm -hmm. Richmond Street Studios. I'd love to hear more about that and how you transitioned the connections that you made into what you felt was more intentional um, community support. So I had a small business. I started actually in LA. I still live in West Hollywood, right by the mm -hmm. House of Blues. Right on. Um, it actually started because I started hearing that silk pillowcases were a good thing. It was like some old Hollywood thing, and that sounded fascinating. I couldn't find one. Um, and so I started manufacturing them. There you go. I started making them, but um, but in kind of like a Robin Hood situation. The profits went to the Covenant House, this place that's for um, runaway and basically thrown away youth. Okay. So kids yeah. that ran away for whatever reason or got tossed out, they, they go to this place called the Covenant House. So... Um, so that's what that was about. And then it just sort of turned into this eco luxury mm -hmm. lifestyle brand. Um, I wanted to grow the business for a variety of reasons. I moved to Austin mm -hmm. and there I, I really, uh, I grew it. And then we had the crash. And at the same time, I, um, reunited with my first boyfriend. We got engaged and I moved back to Albuquerque and oh. he had just moved back where his parents were here. Um, so don't try that at home. They're reuniting 25 <laughs> years later. There's a reason. Um, <laughs> um, but it was a really great thing and I'm, I, I'm glad for the experience. Right. Um, so that's how I ended up back in Albuquerque. So I brought the business with me. Okay. Um, and I just continued doing that. Uh, there's a magazine article in the Bacusa Journal, and I actually reference that maybe loft living is not the greatest for a relationship <laughs> yeah. because there's like really only one door that closes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, it was business, living, and partnership. Yeah, and we were actually both going to school together. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot. That's just too much for. That's more than two peas in a pod. That is too much. <laughs> Nothing's going to survive that. So, um, but my neighbor. So I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reevaluate the business because the crash had happened, um, and I needed to get out. And I thought about working outside the house. And my neighbor mm -hmm. happened to be the costume designer in Breaking Bad. Oh, right on. Um, and the wardrobe supervisor who usually works with her was my brother's ex girlfriend. Oh, it's a very small town. Yeah. <laughs> Except the funniest part of the story is. She didn't connect me with her. I just heard this person talking, mm. and I knew who it was mm -hmm. from the descriptions. There you go. Like, she is this beautiful person that only wears, like, white and black. 
Like it was just really incredible. So I was like, are you? <laughs> Um, and then just from being neighbors and when I talked about some stuff, she said, oh, you'd be great at casting. So I just landed in casting on Breaking Bad, Heck yeah. which was amazing. I thought it was going to be six months and I ended up doing it for three years mm -hmm. on a bunch of different shows and films. And, um, and I, what really drove me was representation on film. Yeah. So that's what really got me attention. But after a while, it was like this three years is a long detour. I have so many questions. Okay. What, is, what does it take to be a casting director? What does it take to make some decisions about who is made for that particular part on that screen at that time? Okay, so for any actors hearing, because you say Breaking Bad, I and mean, all of a sudden starts, people start paying attention. Yeah. Casting directors are rooting for the actors to do well. The part of the process people don't know is that the casting directors actually, and I was just a casting associate. John. Associate. Okay. Um, so we have to actually give directors like four or five choices mm -hmm. so we want everyone to do well <laughs> so we can present choices yeah, yeah. to the directors and then it's kind of a piece of the puzzle is uh you know we can't hire somebody if they look too much like a lead for instance mm -hmm. and those are things that people don't think about um but as far as being a casting um person there's two parts you have to know paperwork because um actors are part of a union and Productions are, you know, that's a, a lot of money goes into each project. Right. So um, part of it is the paperwork part and making sure you're in compliance. And then the, the actual artistic part and uh, casting is above the line. So it's in the creative, um, the creative bunch of roles. You just kind of have to know people. So you have to mm -hmm. read a script, mm -hmm. understand like what, what part they play in the script, but also um, what people think of kind of when you see that character, right. you know, like bad guy or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, and then if you're working like on In Plain Sight, which is super diverse, where they would have different, different uh, ethnicities on mm -hmm. and stuff, you mm -hmm. kind of have to know the architecture of people's faces. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because you don't think about it, but, you know, certain features belong to certain countries, more, you know, sort of more or less. Mm -hmm. We're all, I love this, we're all blending. Um, so that's not super obvious, but yeah, it's a lot about facial architecture. Hmm. So it's not just about great personalities and good resumes. Nope. No way. <laughs> and so did you love it? I did. Yeah. Well, Breaking Bad was incredible because the, you know, uh, Vince Gilligan and everybody down, mm -hmm. um, they were insistent that the experience be great too. Good for the staff, for the crew. Yeah. Like they wanted it to just be a really good experience Yeah. on top of making a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And so In Plain Sight was filmed here. And what else was filmed here that you worked on? A Million Ways to Die in the West with the mm -hmm. Seth MacFarlane mm -hmm. film. And I briefly worked on um, the Killer Woman in Night Shift. Longmire was really great. Oh, Longmire. I miss that. We had a Basque episode, too. That was pretty cool. Yep. Um, that was most of them. Okay. Well, the, I remember that being like somewhere in the back of my mind that was also just this little corner of your life that has really, I think, contributed in a lot of ways to the sustained relationships that you have. Not because you didn't, I don't feel like you just thought of it as the film world. You thought of it as the community of work and creative artists that Albuquerque has. For sure. Yeah. We have this amazing, um, really supportive mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. of creatives of all kinds, artists, musicians. Yeah. Um, for sure. Uh, leaving that world, it's, you're still... You still connect to everybody, and mm -hmm. people don't just do one thing. You know, we don't like an artist might be a, a, an actor, might also be a painter. We have a pretty incredible world full of amazing people here. Mm -hmm. I think we're especially blessed with some fabulous, not just talent, but the number of talented people here. Mm -hmm. There's something that you you mentioned in some of your notes for me here that I mm -hmm. want to make a note of that you specifically said New Mexico sort of like the New California. And that peeps can afford to do creative work and there's nothing there's enough creative economy infrastructure to support that work and i think that that that's probably evolved your perspective of that as well as the creative economy itself um but you i guess i'm partial to that perspective also because i want to see them survive i want to see them be successful right. so how is albuquerque supporting our larger creative economy I mean, we have a lot of work to do. I mean, there are people mm. 
good working on it, right? We had things like Coffee and Creatives was a really good example. Yeah. Um, I mean, we we just have more work to do, and we just yeah. really need to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Well, we have the Groove downtown, which I think is a good example of a place where people can work and sell and show. Yeah. But we need ten of those. You know, we've got art, some art workshops and things that come and go and flow. But as a city, sure, I mean, I think we all recognize we have a housing crisis, mm -hmm. and if we want to keep that creative economy here and keep those creatives here, yeah. I think that's where just a lot of my focus is I right see what now. Because right. I've lived, like, I watched a movie, like for instance, okay, so let's say. The Americana music scene. I I lived that migration. Most of those people are my friends. Mm. So LA was getting really expensive. Everybody moved to Austin. I was kind of okay. a front runner. I wanted to leave LA for um, a couple other reasons, but so I was kind of a little ahead of the pack. But then mm -hmm. everyone moved to Austin. Mm -hmm. Then that started to get really expensive. So right. then a lot of people moved to Nashville, and then <laughs> that got really expensive. And now it's sort of dispersing into smaller towns like around Austin mm -hmm. and around Nashville. Uh, a lot of the creative, creative workforce in LA moved out to Palm Springs, out to the desert. Okay, yeah, yeah. They just call it the desert, right? Yeah, just the desert. Yeah. Um, and then the people that are left kind of have to be there. <laughs> Work there. Mm -hmm. Their livelihoods are there. So I, I just, um, yeah, we have to do things specifically for the creative economy, but I think that's the thing we have to lock down first mm -hmm. before the city gets cooler and more people notice it. You know what I yeah. mean? Like once once it's a destination, mm -hmm. then it's 150 people a day moving. Yeah. Like Austin and Nashville. That's amazing. It's good. I can't, can't wrap my head around that. I know that Albuquerque seen growth, but again, let's draw that connection between the fact that we need to build some more su support for the people that do live here, some more economic... Um, equity for the people that live here before we really try to draw a lot more so that we don't overdo it. Yeah, I mean, I think we have momentum. Mm -hmm. um, the city's perfectly viable. Like, it's not going to backslide, you know, into, I mean, it's not going to get abandoned. No. We're super remote. Like, we play a key role because there's nothing else around us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Like the city has to, is always going to exist. Mm -hmm. Crossroads cities always do. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and we have our own individual strengths that other cities don't have. And I think that one of the things that um, you were saying that you are particularly proud of the city and in support of that larger picture is that people work to lift each other up. Mm -hmm. And if someone has an idea, someone can help with that. And you see that a lot, that, that people will support each other. And Absolutely. I got to get the most amazing... Okay, that Creative Place Making Summit was a perfect example. Mm. I happened to be on a regional planning committee because I was a graduate of that program. I reached out to Sherry Brueggemann, and I was like, hey, you know, it sound like a good idea. And she was like, yeah. And right. then we talked to somebody else, uh, and then they were like, okay, let's do it. And then we went to the mayor, and he was like, oh, for sure. for sure. And then everybody, you know, found a way to benefit or get involved or, mm -hmm. or develop relationships. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I'm super thankful for all the work people put into it right. and all the partnership. Yeah. Over two dozen people and organizations contributed to the application alone. Oh, wow. Nice. Mm -hmm. Talk about community input. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's move on just a little bit before we wrap up. I want to hear more about... Um, let's, let's broaden the description of what your perspective is on life and work and what you, what you brought to my attention, something I don't think I've ever heard of before, is this concept of the third culture kid. And that third culture kids are good at translating different lived experiences and bridging divides. Tell me more about what that experience We is. are. So technically a third culture kid is um, a kid who grew up in a, in a country that's different than their, we call them passport countries. Mm. So other people are like home and we're like, well, that's my passport country. Um, I have the particularly interesting experience of my parents were actually from two different countries mm -hmm. and then two different socioeconomic classes. Right. So that was always, uh, it broadens perspective and is a little bit intense. Um, but third culture kids, because we kind of belong everywhere and nowhere. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of like ethnographers, you know, because you, like, you're a new kid all the time. I went to seven schools by seventh grade. Amazing. I think was three, three continents and then three or four states. I can't remember. 
Um, and so <laughs> you're always the new kid. Yeah. And you kind of figure out um, what people's deal is. And you also, um, you also just really understand that everybody, like every place has its own system. It has its own vibe. It has its own kind of ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. And they're all kind of invented. So um, they're also a little bit unfair. Sure. <laughs> a lot unfair. Yeah. Man-made um, man systems. Uh-huh. And then and, not um, And especially if you just grew up with a lot of privilege, you're like, you know, when I lived in Tehran, uh, I'm like, why are the construction workers rolled up in their prayer rugs and sleeping in a tent? Like, I don't... Good question. What does that mean? And when I moved to Las Cruces, we... I learned a lot, right? And we have different ways of um, dealing with that. But... Um, I don't know. I think it's important not to live in a bubble. Mm. Well, and also, I mean, you, you, you didn't, it's not just that your parents came and that you moved a bunch of times. It was that you had long-term experiences outside of the United States. Yeah. And that alone will, will broaden your, your concept of what is right and wrong and what you can actually be maybe even in control of in your neighborhood, your community, your work. Sure. And I think it just removes a lot of judgment. Like you just understand people are born into circumstances. Mm -hmm. Everybody's working super hard. Um, I just, I hold a couple of things really universal is that everybody deserves basic dignity and that goes both ways. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whether you are underprivileged or overprivileged, when we start losing sight of each other's humanity is when it gets really difficult yeah. to communicate. Mm -hmm. Well, something you also mentioned here in the notes is that uh, not only do people keep you grounded, but the reality in New Mexico that we have keeps you grounded. That's a cognizance of your surroundings, your, privi your privilege, your knowledge, and also how you know connection to the people around you is important. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And people in Mexico are very real. I love Albuquerque for that. We are like defiantly authentic. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, our pride is right on our sleeve. I like that too. Yeah. yeah. So what... Um, what are you doing for fun these days? Because I know you're trying to be more intentional about it. And how are you sort of coming back to the Christina that you know and love? I'm going to get out to more community events. Mm -hmm. I recently went to the poet, there was like a poet laureate event where we had all the poet laureates. Um, and we, uh, a book was recently put together, I think by the city, arts and culture. Mm, probably. Uh, an anthology of all the poets. And then I think the that. poet laureates got to choose a poem. And that was an amazing event. Um, Juneteenth is coming up, right. and I'm very excited about. Mm -hmm. We have fiestas in Bernalas. That's um, always huge. A two-day event, the 8th and 9th is coming oh, up. June? Yeah. Oh, that is coming up. And then, oh, oh at the same time, there is a massive uh, car show, big Bernalas show and shine, first oh. annual, with the cultural centers involved. Um, I'm losing my Spanish. Which is terrifying. So I'm gonna try and get to some film festivals. I don't know. Sounds and we'll go to dinner. Yeah, we'll try something new. Uh huh. Tacos. <laughs> Any <Tuesday>. somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, I would love to support you in that and support just the broader connection of the importance of being in community, whatever that looks like for you. Yeah, you're all over it. Well, I want to thank you, and I'm so grateful. <laughs> Thanks for you. Me too. And it's been important for me and my relationships to to sometimes get out of my comfort zone in order to be supportive of the larger community yeah so um is there anything else you wanted to add about how people can get involved in the main street or coalition or is it more like show up and attend or we actually do have volunteer things or what are you what are you looking at this summer we're going to start putting out some volunteer stuff like at the moment the bridalis is just at the forefront of all change so it's really exciting we have a ton of momentum going um, and I think the community is just really trying to catch up. I mean, it's, you know, it's over a thousand years of history. Right. It's hundreds of, you know, years for many of these families. Because what's so exciting to me about Bredelas is that, um, that it's unique in that the legacy families, so these original families have been adapting to change. Mm -hmm. um, and doing, like, incredible things. Uh, rather than being like sort of new waves of people moving in and then moving on. It's both welcome people and being like a springboard. Um, but it's also these families have been there forever. Yeah. So we're doing, uh, we're having a lot of community conversations right on. about, you know, sort of what's important 
um, what do they want to see happen, and then making sure that they're not displaced, either Absolutely. physically or culturally. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. Okay. We have things coming up. Yeah. Um, is it and also encourage people to attend rail yard events. Absolutely. Like so the rail yards is uh, the rail yards market mm -hmm. is open every Sunday. Finally. Through October, I know it's yeah. exciting. Um, and then I don't know if everybody knows about this um, mm -hmm. CNM Film Academy, New Mexico Media Academy. Is coming to the rail yards and they're in yeah. the middle of It's construction. under construction, but I don't know that people know what a bigger deal it is now. I don't think they do. It was a big deal when it was CNM's film programming. Mm -hmm. And now it's um, partnered with um, the state of New Mexico economic development. Oh, yeah. And so it's kind of a um, figuring out how to how to leverage all film programs in the state, mm -hmm. and then figure out the best path forward for all those students because now we have a lot graduating. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's incredible. I've loved to see the tra the trajectory of that growth. Yeah, mm -hmm. cool. So there's a lot to keep um, posted on, and if people are interested in finding out more, maybe they could reach out to you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, at info at bridalist.net, and then we're on the socials. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you, Christina. I Thank you, Mariah. It. Yeah. Thank you also to the Bloomstone for providing our beautiful little fern today. It was in between us and this beautiful crystal. And we hope you guys come back for another ABQ Action.